Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Mary Grant, the Public Water for All Campaign Director at Food and Water Watch. During this session, we are going to talk about water access. The pandemic has shown a spotlight on our nation's water affordability crisis. Right away, the CDC was telling people to wash their hands and slow to help slow the spread of disease. But many people couldn't take that simple advice because their service was shut off in a typical year before the pandemic. Our national survey estimated that 15 million people experienced a water shutoff over unaffordable bills. Fortunately, beginning last March, hundreds of local go governments and dozens of states stepped up and put protections in place to suspend water shutoffs. But dangerously, most of these protections have already expired by the latest Delta wave. Today, we're gonna to talk with some experts from Cornell University about their research into who is protected from water shutoffs and what the impacts of those protections have been. Dr. Mildred E. Warner is a professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell, where her work focuses primarily on local government service delivery, finance, and public health. Her research on water explores differences in public policy choices of state and local governments, especially as regards privatization and water shutoff protections. Dr. Shui Zhang is a postdoctoral associate in the Department of City and Regional Planning in the Department of Global Development. Her research focuses on public policy analysis and public health. We are so happy to have you join us today. Thank Mildred, you. I'm going to start with you. Your research has examined local policies around water shutoff protections that were in place before the pandemic. To provide some background, what was the state of water shutoff protections pre-COVID in the United States? And has your research uncovered any trends with regard to utility ownership? Well, Mary, the U.S. stands out in the world in not having protections against water shutoff. And this is because in the U.S. we tend to think of water as a commodity, not as a human right. In other countries, water is often thought of as a human right, and so basic access to a minimum level of water for survival is guaranteed. For example, utilities in most European countries have to meet universal service obligations, universal access, and provide a minimum daily allotment. These countries have programs to cross-subsidize water utilities to help pay for coverage for low-income residents. Even in developing countries, minimum daily allotments are common. We did a survey of all cities and counties in the U.S. in 2015 and found that only 8% of the responding cities and counties, that's 153 of the 1897 cities and counties, actually had a program to protect consumers from water shutoff. Those that did were more likely to be municipally owned utilities. These utilities also were more likely to employ water conservation measures. So equity and environmental conservation seem to go hand in hand. Cities with water shutoff protections were also more likely to be in a state with comprehensive public utility regulation. They were more likely to have an equity goal in their sustainability plan. And interestingly, they were more likely to be suburbs and rural areas and not cities. This might be because cities are facing special fiscal stress. And they were more likely to have a democratic controlled council. That's very telling, um, especially around the ownership and who is putting in place protections even before the pandemic. We've really struggled to get any data at all from water corporations about water shutoffs. Mildred, you've also looked at shutoff protections in response to COVID. Can you tell us what predicts who was protected and was there any connection with race, politics or ownership? Well, things really changed with COVID. As in March 2020, many states and cities began to put in place moratoria on water shutoff because they knew that with COVID, people needed to wash their hands and CDC was recommending this as guidance. I was, I was in my car driving and on March 9th, I remember a, a NPR story about um, Detroit, Michigan having imposed a moratorium and they referenced this Food and Water Watch database. And so when I got home, I looked it up online and saw what a cool database it was. Let, let's show the slide so people can see what it looks like. At the bottom of this slide, you can see the database where people were able to crowdsource it with hot links of various decrees and proclamations made by governors and mayors all across the country. And so I got together with Dr. Zhang and Dr. Marcela Gonzalez from the University of Pittsburgh to begin studying this database. 
And what we saw in this slide shows that between March and May of 2020, 34 states and 483 cities imposed moratoria on water shutoff in those first two months of the pandemic. And 111 of these cities were in states that did not impose statewide moratoria. So we looked at those cities too, because in those states, it's only those cities, the only protections households would have would be in those particular cities. So what we found is that in states were more likely to impose a moratorium and impose it sooner if their public utility commission regulates private utilities. They were also more likely to impose it sooner if they had higher COVID case rates in March and April. They saw the connection between water shutoffs and public health. But they were less likely to impose a moratorium if they had unified Republican control of the state legislature and governorship. And unfortunately, this shows the politicization of the public health response. We also controlled for private ownership and various measures of need poverty, minority, unemployment, urban, but none of these matters. In states without moratoria, we looked at the cities that did not, that, that did impose a moratorium. And what we found here, Mary, was that these cities had more need as measured by minority population and poverty. They had more capacity in terms of per capita income, and they were in counties with higher community health. These cities were also in counties with lower COVID case rates and unfortunately less likely to have voted for President Trump. Thus, there's a link between water protection, environmental conservation, and social equity, but this politicization of water shutoff protections was something we also found in other work around COVID shutoff and reopen policies. So this made us interested in looking at the potential impact of water moratoria on actual COVID infection and death. Thank you, Mildred. It's so unfortunate that water shutoff protections would be politicized. You would think of just a basic public health intervention. Um, by June 2020, 34 states had imposed moratoria on water shutoffs, and 20 of those were comprehensive, applying to all public and private systems in the state. Shui, you analyzed how these moratoria relate to COVID infections and deaths. Can you tell us a little bit about what you found? Sure. So thank you for the awesome data set we got from Food and Water Watch. This data set allows us to analyze the important role of moratorium on water shutoff in the COVID-19 infection and death. And let me show you some maps we made. Next. So as you can see, in early last year, and about 34 out of 50 states imposed moratorium on water shutoff. As you can see on the left side of the map, those states are shown in lighter blue and dark blue. And among the 34 states, 20 of them imposed a comprehensive coverage on water shuttle moratorium, which means the moratorium covers all the water system within the state. That is amazing news because a lot of states impose a moratorium to help people get equitable access to the water. However, at the end of last year, as you can see on the red side of the map, there were only 11 states out of the 50 states still had an active moratorium. And those states are shown in the dark blue. For example, the New York and California, there's only 11 states still have the moratorium. And next slide, please. So in this research, we want to see if the moratorium can lower the COVID-19 infection growth rate and death growth rate. What we found in this research is intriguing. If a moratorium had been in place, the COVID-19 infection growth rate could have been 0.24% lower. Similarly, the COVID-19 death growth rate could have been 0.14% lower. Maybe the number is not very intuitive. We made some estimation based on the number we got from sophisticated modeling. What we found is that if there were nationwide moratorium, the moratorium could have protected almost half a million people from COVID-19 infection, and it could have protected almost 9,000 people from COVID-19 death. We also estimated the number for each state in the US. 
as you can see on the map in the lower part of this slide. If there is an, a statewide moratorium during our study period last year for a single state, there could be as many as more than 66,000 people could be protected from the COVID-19 infection. Remember, that is for a single state. And we found a similar result for the COVID-19 death. For a state, it could have protected more than 1,000 people from COVID-19 deaths if there was statewide moratorium for that state. So this research really shows the important role of moratorium on water shutoff in the public health in the COVID-19. It does seem almost common sense that a water shutoff moratorium would be an important public health intervention during a pandemic, a viral pandemic in particular. Um, but it's so incredibly important to have some really hard data to back this up. Um, it's really powerful numbers to have at our fingertips to point to about why we need these protections. Um, Shui, can you tell us a little bit about how reliable this model is and has it been used in any other peer-reviewed studies? Yes, of course. Let me briefly show you how the model works. So in this research, we want to analyze the impact of statewide moratorium on COVID-19 infection growth rate and death growth rate. And in this study, we used a method called event study. We view moratorium as an event. If the state imposes moratorium in each day, so in this study, we analyze for each state and for each day. And you can see the study period is from April 17 to December 31. So it gave us almost 13,000 observations to do this study. And a unique feature of this study is that we do not only consider when the state imposed a moratorium, we also considered the time period of the moratorium. I will give you an example about for two states, South Carolina and Michigan. As you can see on the right side of the slide, for the South Carolina, it imposed a very short period of partial moratorium on water shutoff, which means the moratorium only covers the regulated water system. And for the Michigan, it shows a different scenario. It has a comprehensive moratorium on water shut off between April and October. Then the moratorium expired. But Michigan resumed the moratorium on water shut off in December 15th. So in this study, we considered the time period, we considered state action for each day. And this study has been peer reviewed in the journal and this paper will be published this year in the American Journal of Poetic Medicine. And yes, we use the similar methodology on other research as well. In the next slide, you can see that we use the same method in one study to analyze different state actions, including shutdown, mask mandate, and reopen. And you can see the similar as the moratorium on water shut off. States also have different actions and shutdown. For most states, they have a shutdown in March and April last year, but they have different shutdown period. Compared to the South Carolina and Georgia, which have a relatively short shutdown period, New York has a longer shutdown period. Also, for the New York, it imposed a mask mandate as early as mid-April, mid compared to South Carolina and Georgia, which didn't impose mask mandate. So we also use event study in other research for the peer review article, articles to justify the sophisticated modeling research we have done for the moratorium on water shadow. That's amazing. Thank you, Shui. This is really a critical analysis, and I hope that it will help inform public health policy decisions and measures. Um, Mildred, can you talk about what some of these findings might mean and what the bigger picture is for government officials and policymakers? 
Well, you know, the bigger picture is the problem of affordability. And most communities face problems of affordability for their low income households. Now the EPA recommends that households should not spend more than 2% of their income on water bills, but some low income households spend as much as 10%. And while some states and cities have instituted subsidy programs like Michigan, like New York where I live, like Philadelphia, other states prohibit subsidies by their utilities. This includes New Jersey, Maryland, uh, Colorado, California. So in communities with privately owned water systems, low income households spend more of their household income on their water bills. So we also worked again with uh, Mary at Food and Water Watch on this database that they had created on water rates for the 500 largest cities in the US. And we found that private ownership may contribute to the affordability problem. We found that the average annual water bill was $144 higher in communities with private water systems. And for the lowest 20% of the income distribution, that lowest quintile, they spent 1.5% more of their household income on water if their water utility was private. And remember, the EPA says only spend 2% of your household income on water. We also found a regulatory effect. In states like New Jersey and Pennsylvania, which have changed their policy environment to be more favorable to private investment in water, water bills cost an average $87 more a year. Now, the regulatory features that New Jersey and Pennsylvania have, have led in implementing include things like something called fair market value, which is actually higher than market valuation of the water system. And they also allow extra charges, which gets passed on to consumers. So in this modeling, we controlled for the age of the system, because older systems might cost more, the size of the city for economies of scale, the level of need, poverty, and the source of water, whether it was groundwater or surface water. And even when we controlled for all these things, these results still held. Um, prices are higher in privately owned systems, and in states with favorable regulation toward private water, prices are higher still and affordability problems are greater. So this is why we need national standards on affordability programs and protections from water shutoff. I couldn't agree more. These findings, both this study and the, the forthcoming study about prices, uh, they speak to a really a strong need for more federal action. At Food and Water Watch, we've been calling for water debt relief and a nationwide moratorium through Maintaining Access to Essential Services Act to address the immediate needs of making sure people have water that they can afford. But long term, we know we need to change how we pay for water infrastructure to ensure that every person has access to affordable and safe water, regardless of their income or their zip code. That's why since our founding, we've been working for a water trust fund. And we've had some real milestones along the way. Right now in Congress, the Water Affordability, Transparency, Equity, and Reliability Act, or the Water Act, has more than 90 co-sponsors in the House and Senate. It was introduced by Representatives Lawrence and Kana in the House and Senator Sanders in the Senate. It is the most comprehensive solution for funding our water and wastewater systems. It would restore the federal government's commitment to safe water, providing a dedicated $35 billion each and every year. That's what EPA says we need to spend to our water and wastewater infrastructure. It would help remove lead and PFAS from water, make water service more affordable, stop sewage spills, prevent privatization, and help us achieve our vision of safe public water for every person in the country. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And a special thank you to our amazing guest speakers, Professor Mildred Warner and Dr. Shui Zhang. Thanks again, everyone for joining.